So going back to this and, and advocating for protection of, of these transitional estuary type habitats, as I said, we don't have many, so we basically write off the one-year-olds when they leave or the, the young of the year when they leave because their likelihood of coming back is, is so low. But the Canadians are fortunate in the way that um, the glaciers left their part of the lake. They, they do have this big transitional habitat. So this is a lot that I just first just focus on, on these two bars here on the, the far right. And these are all the, the adults and, and uh, the French and the Knife River are the two rivers that we have fish traps on. So there are two um, rivers that we intensively manage and, and know exactly what's going on, or at least we think we do. Um, and this neon green is, is basically the, the adult came back um, that spent one year in the stream. Um, purple is two years in the stream and, and light blue is three years in the stream. So you can see the majority of our fish that come back, as I stated, spent two years in the stream. Now, I made this graph look like this just so it, it, <laughs> it, it looked like this. But basically, the rest of these streams from here, over, from McIntyre over to Portage, are all Canadian streams. And Portage um, flows into the Thunder Bay. And basically, all these flow into the bigger bays. And then when you get over to this part, they flow into smaller bays in Canada. So my point in this slide is that a lot of the Canadian steelhead that you, again, age their scales and figure out how long the adults had spent in the stream, a lot of them get forced out prematurely because their their geology is the same as ours. They don't have groundwater and they've got bedrock and their streams get warm, but they've got this transitional estuary type habitat where their one-year-olds are actually able to, to make it out there um, and return as adults. <clears throat> so. This, this hopefully reinforces how important it is to protect whatever bay type habitat we have on the Minnesota shore. Because you'll increase the likelihood of, of trout and salmon that come back to the anglers. <clears throat> I'm gonna switch a little bit here just because most of you guys I assume are from Duluth. We didn't go around, but, um, and talk about Miller Creek. Miller Creek used to be one of the best brook trout streams in, in northeastern Minnesota. Um, Miller Creek starts, or ex flows into um, St. Louis Bay down by WLSSD, um, and basically goes up the hill, goes by Lake Superior College, wraps around behind the mall, and just basically down the hill behind Penny's, which I'm sure you've driven right there, and ends up right by the airport. So it's a, it's a pretty small watershed, and before a lot of the development, it used to be one of our, our best brook trout streams. So we do surveys there every year just to monitor what's going on based on the effects of, of development within the watershed. So basically, um, I can update this, but I had given this presentation in 2006, so every 10 years they figure out the, the amount of impervious surface that has been added to the watershed, basically blacktop parking lots, big roofs of, of big box stores like Target or Walmart or whatever. Um, and between 1990 and 2000, the watershed, which really isn't that big, gained about 90 acres of impervious, impervious surface. That, that's a lot. Um, so basically, the brook trout's losing. But we've selected big box stores and fast food over, over brook trout, which we all have to make decisions in life. Um, Chambers, Chambersburg Road, on Miller Creek is basically if you're in the J.C. Penney parking lot and you go over the hill, which the, um, Miller Creek is just on the hill. If you went downstream, which is essentially down toward um, Home Depot or behind Texas Roadhouse now, um, Chambersburg Road is the first road crossing back there, and that's one of our index stations downstream of basically developed. Um, and this is from 1993 to 2006, <coughs> and this is the number of age one and older brook trout that we sampled at our, our index station. And you can you notice the trend that's going on with, with increases in development. I mean, I could throw development and it would go like that. And brook trout goes like that. So um, it, it's certainly a trade-off and something that if you guys are teaching curriculum about the effects of, of what we do on, on a watershed, this is kind of our post, poster child of how not to treat a trout stream. So this, 
this is an interesting thing that that maybe you guys can relate to your students, but again on the x-axis we've got dates from June to, to September and, and temperature, and this is our same same thing. This is for brook trout, but um, the range below growth, the range of growth, stress, and lethal. And on here I've added um, basically rainfall events. These, these spikes are basically rainfall events, and you'll notice the biggest spike happened, I mean this is 2001 and 2002 data, and you can do this with any year, um, but basically it rained three and a half inches up by the mall. And there's a weather station up at the airport, so it's a pretty close um, gauge of what's going on. And you can see within a couple days, the water temperatures went from where the, the brook trout were enjoying life, and basically, as soon as all the water hits all the parking lots, all the roofs, everything, it all goes to Miller Creek. So, as you sit in the mall and you watch the parking lot steaming, and all, all that water is going right into a trout stream. Which I, I think it's interesting that basically, when it rains three and a half inches or even a half inch, um, water temperatures go from where the brook trout are happy to basically you're approaching approaching a lot of uh, mortality. And I'm sure with with increases in, in impervious surfaces, there's there's a tipping point in the watershed, and at some point in time, you know we'll get a four inch rain rainstorm and and the brook trout will be gone. But uh, it's an, it's an interesting concept just uh, to think about how much development a watershed can can sustain, or a trout stream within a watershed can sustain. So in conclusion, um, trout and salmon have been present on the Minnesota shore of Lake Superior for, everything that we have now has been present for, for a long time and some for thousands of years. Um, and they're pretty tolerant species, but um, we're also at the tipping point with, with a lot of things, with development within the watershed. And if we don't protect our, our riparian corridors and our wetlands and all that, that good stuff, that we'll, we'll probably be over, over that tipping point and, and see a lot of uh, elimination of trout and some, some tributaries in the not too distant future. So it's very important, habitat protection is important um, figuring out where the groundwater is in our watershed and protecting it, um, protecting the bays or estuary type environments along Lake Superior, um, and, all, and if we do all these things, it'll result in increased survival for juvenile trout and anglers catching more trout if that's the goal in life. But uh, there's a lot of other things that benefit have benefit as a result of these things other than trout. If you're not just an with that, I can I can certainly go through any slide that you want to, or have any questions. Maybe. Can you talk a little more about 